a wary hunter, sniffs the air in a wild Welsh valley. Polecats were once common throughout Britain, but by the 1950s only a handful remained, confined to the woods and dingles of Wales. So what led to the sudden decline of this shy nocturnal creature? Polecats are opportunists and often feed on roadside carrion. Sadly, today most people's only glimpse of a polecat is a bundle of fur by the side of the road, especially in autumn, when young polecats themselves become road casualties. Polecats belong to the weasel family and are among Britain's oldest native mammals. They have always been persecuted by man. Yet it is a different story for a close relation, the domesticated ferret. The ferret is a polecat in a white coat, bred by man from wild polecats since Roman times to flush rabbits from their burrows. Ferreting is still a popular country sport, and these ferocious little animals are greatly admired by their masters. Pure ferrets are albino, with pink eyes. These are darker, polecat ferrets, a cross between a ferret and a wild polecat. Polecats are more aggressive than ferrets, and are impossible to keep. So what dreadful deeds turned man against the polecat? Though shy and elusive, they are not afraid of human habitation, and are notorious killers of poultry. The French name, poule chat, means chicken cat, and it is this reputation as a killer of poultry that has done the polecat most harm. Nor is this reputation unfounded. During the 19th century, pheasant shooting became popular across the country. Polecats found the newly introduced birds easy game, but soon themselves fell victim to the gamekeeper's gin traps. Many were also trapped for their fur, known as fitch fur, and numbers began to fall rapidly. After the war, the gamekeeper's gibbet became a less common sight, but this was nearly too late for the polecat. Only a few clung on in remote parts of mid Wales. When deadly myxomatosis decimated the rabbit population in the 1950s, polecats sought new prey, plentiful in the Welsh river valleys and marshes. They have been known to paralyze frogs by skillfully breaking their backs. This allows them to keep a stock of fresh frogs for the winter months. 
Polecats prefer to hunt by night, but they have a keen nose for carrion at any time. In some parts of Wales, farmers string up dead crows to frighten others away, the original scarecrow. A warning ignored by this determined polecat. Powerful jaws enable it to use its full weight to drag its prize away. Polecats are solitary hunters and tend to stay within the bounds of their own territories. The only time they actively seek out another of their kind is during the breeding season. Female polecats come into heat towards the start of April. Most polecats are able to breed once they're a year old. This male senses that a female in breeding condition has crossed his territory. begins to follow her musky trail of scent markings through the woods, warily, because at this time of year he must also be ready to fend off other males. One by one, the scent messages lure him on. He sees well at night, but mainly he's led by the nose. At last, he finds her. The rough wooing that follows is typical polecat behavior and causes the female to ovulate prior to mating. The male drags her about by the scruff of the neck for quite some time, inflicting wounds which will show later as scar tissue, a sure sign that a female has been mated. It looks more like rape than seduction. Mating can take over an hour. Finally, the male leaves the female to lick her wounds. It will be six weeks before the female gives birth, in midsummer. Her mate will play no further part in the rearing of his offspring. During the next few weeks, the female spends most of her time hunting. She must put on weight in preparation for the confinement ahead. Summer, grey herons stalk the shallow streams. With fish so plentiful, it's surprising that this relative of the otter ignores the river's bounty. The female has been feeding on a varied diet of voles, rabbits, worms and frogs. Polecats don't seem to like getting wet. By 
By now, the female has found a suitable place to raise her young. Polecats frequently use rabbit burrows after they have eaten the occupants. But first, there are preparations to be made. She carefully packs the hollow with dead leaves and bracken to form a snug nest. One night in June, she gives birth to seven kits. Polecats can produce litters of ten, but it is unlikely that all would survive. At first, the young are blind and covered with silky white hair. Their main objective is to drink as much milk as possible. It's now clear why the female put on weight earlier in the spring. There is no time to go hunting. During the kit's first few weeks of life, she suckles the litter almost continuously. After six weeks, their white coat has been covered by darker guard hairs, and their eyes are open. By now, they're able to eat flesh. The distinctive mask begins to appear at this stage. Managing a handful of kits like this is a full-time business. Already they are eager to explore their surroundings, but at this stage it is dangerous to venture outside. Their mother always blocks up the entrance with leaves before she goes hunting, to keep predators such as foxes and buzzards at bay. Now that the rabbit population has recovered from myxomatosis, they are once again a prime target for polecats. The mother polecat stalks the rabbits when they are feeding, soon after dawn. Polecats have poor vision, but a highly developed sense of smell. She attacks from behind, sinking her jaws into the rabbit's neck to deliver a swift, deadly bite. Then she drags the carcass home for the waiting kits. They, meanwhile, hungry and impatient, have pushed their protective curtain of leaves aside, alerted by the smell of supper.
She will allow them to eat their fill before she satisfies her own hunger. Only when they have had enough does she settle down to feed undisturbed. During autumn, it is not only the trees which change colour. Some adult polecats moult over a period of about ten days, losing most of their dark guard hairs, exposing a thick pelt of pale underfur. Some adults also moult during the spring, although the colour change is less noticeable. They mark their territories with a fetid smell that tells any other visiting polecat it is trespassing. The stink of a polecat's scent glands have earned it the title Foul Mart. Other polecats ignore these pungent warnings at their peril. This unsuspecting youngster has crossed another's territory. After a brief skirmish, the young intruder is forced to give up its kill to the adult. By now, the young polecats are 12 weeks old and are keen to explore. Their masked faces are alert to every drifting scent. They have to learn what's worth eating and what to avoid. Following the shiny track of a slug brings a choice reward for an inquisitive youngster. It seems that slugs and snails are what little polecats are made of. But there is still much to learn. These are valuable weeks as they spend a great deal of time play fighting, refining the hunting skills they'll need for larger prey. classic neck bite, though instinctive, has to be practiced before it is perfect. As the young polecats approach their first winter, 
They will need every ounce of skill for the solitary life ahead. Their mother stops feeding them. From now on, they're on their own. Now is the cruelest time for the polecat. Small wonder that it's tempted to move close to the comforts of man and take its chance, along with others. It's in these cold winter months that many inexperienced polecats die. Unlike weasels and stoats, they do not forage for mice or voles when the ground is frozen hard. Instead, many seek shelter in barns and outhouses where they can avoid the worst of the weather. It is now that most sightings of polecats are made. Often there is a bonus, wood mice. The mice have moved in to steal the farmer's grain. Now they'll become a meal for the polecat. Yet some farmers still regard polecats as vermin, even though they keep down rats and mice. The polecat starts to explore its new winter quarters. Unfortunately, it hasn't got the barn all to itself. Another hunter appears in the loft, the farmer's ferret, perhaps set to catch mice or on an unofficial sortie from its cage. This is a battle which might easily turn into a love match. Under the skin, every domestic ferret is still a polecat and able to interbreed. Their offspring, polecat ferrets, often manage to live successfully in the wild. But what about the future of our native wild polecat? They are now a protected species, and in Wales at least, they are increasing. Every autumn, a new generation disperses to set up territories of their own. During the winter, many will starve. Others will fall victim to fox, buzzard, or man. Yet every year, the polecat's frontiers spread outwards from Wales, regaining ground it gave up long ago. Until, in time, perhaps the polecat's musky odor will again become familiar throughout the British countryside. <laughs>